In Stratford, the community is mourning the loss of a police officer who passed away on Wednesday following a sudden cardiac event. News 8's Evan Zamara sat down with the officer's four children who described the impact he had on everyone he met. Ken Kubel was a police officer for decades, serving in both Bridgeport and here in Stratford. To his family, his children tell me he was their real life superhero. In Stratford, he was known as Officer Ken Kubel, but to Christina, Kenneth, Matt, and Arlie, he was dad. It's easy for everybody to say that their dad's the greatest guy in the world. But he really was. But this, this was different. They're left processing the unimaginable, life without him. The 56-year-old passed away on Wednesday from a sudden cardiac event. My dad was the biggest gentle giant anyone would ever, anyone would ever meet. He had a heart that was 10 times bigger than anyone I've ever met. Dad, I uh, just want you to know that I love you. We all love you. His children tell us he greeted everyone with kindness and empathy, deeply impacting the lives of those he met. The amount of messages and texts and phone calls we've gotten about how much of a kind man you were. It's not just something people are saying, it's true. We all got cheated out of him, and not just us. The whole world did. We all got cheated. I love you, Dad, wherever you are. Above all, they say Kubel was a devoted family man who was their role model and cheerleader. He was so proud of me, and I know what he kept telling me. This loss is being felt by those who served alongside him in Stratford. He just had a tremendous gift of empathy and compassion, you know, not just as a police officer, but as a human being. He's been a stand-up officer and a human being. Kubel was also a grandfather, friend to all, and husband to his wife, Anne, who he shared 30 years with, creating beloved traditions and building this life together. No one will ever fill your shoes, ever, in our lifetime. <laughs> and we all love you and we'll miss you dearly. In Stratford, Eva Zamaris, News 8. Good morning, and welcome to the Bad Apple Report. It's 7.30 a.m., bright and early right here at Home on the Range. And it's a beautiful Saturday here. And that's a sad way to start out the day. That cop and his family will never be together on Saturday morning again. And uh, I could tell he was a good guy. Not just because he didn't have all the sleeve tattoos and the black ring and the blue line around the black ring and the Punisher sticker in his car and Betty Crocker hairdo, no. I could tell because of the way his family loved him. He was a good family man. Okay. And now... Here's what's happening out in California. It's been two years, nine months, and 22 days since this city intentionally and willfully devastated the lives of its dedicated employees. You stripped careers and commands from your LAPD officers and your LAFD firefighters. Well, Tuesday, after almost three years, the L.A. City Council voted unanimously to lift the city's policy requiring municipal employees get back. 19. The move also establishes a pathway back to employment for the employees, 86 of them terminated for non-compliance with that mandate. Jennifer Kennedy is an attorney. You just heard her there in that clip during public comment from yesterday's city council meeting, and she joins me now in studio. Good to have you. You've been very busy of late. You are repping 141. You're representing 141 employees, former and current within L.A. City. Who are these people? You know, what's interesting is it, the number is greater than 86 because so many people are those terminated and also those forced to resign or forced to take the earlier retirement they didn't want to. They are police and fire. They are paramedics and locksmiths. They are every civilian department you can think of in the city. They are airport workers. They are metro. They are school police. These are people who are dedicated public servants who were forced out of their jobs because of this. What is the basis of your case? The basis of our case is on federal law, this was an emergency use authorization drug. It was an investigational product. And with investigational EUA products, you always have the right to say no. And that's what the city ignored. And that's what the city told their employees they didn't have the right to do. When, when people hear about the authorization of the COVID 
vaccine, it can kind of get lost in the weeds. So I want to make it clear. Yeah. Is this case anti or anti-mandate? Not in not in slightest. It's anti-mandate because you cannot mandate an EUA product and you cannot require involuntary participation with an investigational product. You know, I've heard legal analysts who uh, who would say to that, look, this was a once in a lifetime pandemic. Like we didn't know what was going on. Public health, and the, in the name of public health, a lot of these are first responders that you represent, police and fire. They, they had to get the vaccine mandate. The legal argument? The legal argument is, no, they didn't. Number one, this mandate came out after the CDC had globally admitted that the shots did not prevent infection or transmission. And if they don't do that, if your shot doesn't protect another person, where's the public safety argument? Number one, there isn't. And you will saw that nationwide the mandates came out after it was already conceded the shots didn't do what they desperately wanted it to do. And I know that there's certainly some someone in the audience tonight who, who probably is a L.A. City employee who did go ahead and get the vaccine. Yes. And the vast majority did. And for those people who are hearing this, regardless of the anti versus anti-mandate, they say, well, if, he, if they just would have gotten the shot, we wouldn't be here. We heard that a lot. We heard, why don't you just get it? But again, a lot of people had religious objections to taking that shot. People had medical exemptions and resistance to taking that shot. And you know what? People need to have the ability to just say no, because Americans, that's our right. And the people who did take the shot to keep their job, many of them were injured and they can't work any longer. So where's the justice in that? What does a victory look like for you in the 141 people you represent? Because there is a pathway back to reemployment. There is a pathway and it is not adequate at the moment. The pathway is that these employees who were terminated and pushed out of their jobs, they're welcome to reapply. And there's no guarantee as to seniority, back pay, reinstatement of their pensions. What do you do for a 35-year battalion chief that you took out of his command? What do you do for that man? You make him whole. What do you do with the top, with the 15-year LAPD uh, officer? You put them back and make them whole. Victory for me in litigation is compensation for what they suffered, reinstatement, and making them whole in every possible way. Well, you're going to be busy uh, because I know that the, your, your litigation is really just getting started. Jennifer Kennedy, appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marla. All right, Alex, over to you. And now back with the program. Is it a man? Is it a thumb? It's Balderrama. And there's nobody balder than Balderrama. That's what the report says. No, that's what this report says. This report says new, t new details about Fresno Police Chief Paco Balderrama's inappropriate off-duty relationship. <laughs> what? That's what this report says. Well, let's find out. The new details are coming to light about Fresno Police Chief Paco Balderrama's relationship at the center of a city investigation. Paco. Come on, Paco. Action News has learned through multiple sources that the inappropriate off-duty relationship was with the wife of a Fresno police officer. Oh, my. El, el perro. El perro. Okay, members of the Fresno Police Officers Association met Wednesday afternoon, but the president told Action News it was a regular meeting. Yeah. Okay. We didn't feel it would be prudent to take any kind of action now that you guys know we're meeting to take care of business and whatnot. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. That's what he was thinking. I'm sure of it. No, he said, we didn't feel it would be prudent to take any kind of action while there's an ongoing investigation. Fresno Police Officers Association President Brandon Y. Miller said, sorry, you guys. I can't see this morning. We've always advocated for due process for our officers, and this would be no different. We haven't called for any kind of action to be taken against the chief. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Mm, yeah, right, he said. Action News is also learning the chief could be looking to leave for us. <laughs> oh, you guys, this is getting good. The chief could be looking to leave Fresno. Hell yeah, he's probably already got his bags packed, and he's got that cop's wife with him just kidding allegedly i mean the austin american statesman and abc affiliate kvue reported tuesday that balderrama 
applied to lead the Austin, Texas police force. Hey, there's swingers down there in Austin. You'll be fine down there, buddy. He's one of 32 applicants. Okay. You guys can all just get naked and jump in a pile. All right. Oh, just kidding. Allegedly. Oh, you guys, they're really going to be looking for someone with mid to big city. Oh, actually being a chief of one of those of a comparable size <laughs> department. Public safety reporter Sky Sipe told Action News, Woo, Sky! I wonder if Sky is a reporter. Okay, it is unclear whether Balderrama put his hat in the race. You guys, this is this just too much going on here. Okay, but the application opened on May 15th and closed on June 10th. Balderrama would have applied well after city leaders became aware of the situation. Whoa, I know. They're like, oh, man, get that guy. Wow. The city of Fresno says he first approached the mayor and city manager in February to disclose details about the relationship. Whoa. Okay, the city attorney will not confirm when the investigation into Balderrama formally opened, but the city announced it publicly on June 6th, four days before the city of Austin closed its application. Oh, I bet there was a big shouting match in the dressing room. Hey, you stole my wife. That's when everybody found out, right? Just kidding. Some of these people, you know, you're kind of looking at them. Do you think there's a good chance with your past that you could be given a job here? Sipe said, oh, Sky, baby, baby, baby. It is unclear when the investigation could wrap up or if Balderrama is still under consideration to be chief in austin why well, hell yeah he's about to be famous he's going to be on the bad apple report then they're gonna be like we really got to get him now okay action news has not heard back from austin officials well oh uh, look at that guy come on where are you gonna find a guy oh just kidding you can find a thumb anywhere <laughs> all right on with the show tonight at 11 this is a bizarre story here folks a local city has now fired its police chief and suspended the entire police department amid an ongoing investigation. So the city of Warm Springs in Meriwether County has a population of about 450 people. It's roughly an hour south of Atlanta. Well, the city is not disclosing exactly why it fired its police chief, Emilio Quintana, and suspended the entire department, only telling 11 Alive the action was taken because of, quote, recent events and emergent concerns regarding the conduct and operations within the department. So the city appointed an interim police chief, Aisha Al-Khalifa, Khalifa, and by the way, she's the only person not suspended in, by the department. Uh, we have made several requests tonight to learn more about when the suspension took effect, how many people are suspended, and what led to this? Of course, we're going to keep you updated on air and online at 11alive.com. Tonight. Dang it, I hate those bizarre stories that don't tell us anything. Damn it. All right, I guess I should wait to report on those and we'll find out what's up with that chief and all those guys. All right. All right, thanks, Ramesha. Well, the Precinct 4 deputy who survived last week's shooting will tell his story exclusively right here on Fox 26 with Domley Keith tomorrow at 5 p.m. Only on Fox tonight, though, see the unbelievable video as the shots rang out. Domley Keith joining us live from the North Harris County neighborhood on Slashwood near TC Jester and Cypress Wood, where the gunfire erupted. The footage of Precinct 4 Deputy Deterion Fontenot being ambushed with an AR-15 rifle is hard to watch. The shooting happened right here in this northwest Harris County neighborhood here on Slashwood Lane as the deputy chased a man accused of robbing two Academy sporting goods stores. The accused robber stopped his truck right about here and in the video you can see Deputy Fontenot is right behind him Hands and up. you see the man in the video reach in the truck, grab an AR-15 and open fire. He says, put your hands up, put your hands up. The guy unloads on him. God was looking out for our deputy because the bullet holes were all around where he was standing. The deputy Fontenot had someone shoot at him at point blank range with an AR-15 and he walked away to tell about it. About 16 rounds, all of them striking the vehicle, several of the shrapnel striking his face, cutting his lip. It, complete miracle. 23-year-old DeAnthony Sims Coleman is now charged with aggravated assault of a public servant. 
the first thing that that family told our deputies is thank y'all for not killing him. Our deputies would have ever right to kill him dead. And, uh, you know, he's got a gun. He's done shot at one of our deputies. You know, I was actually with you doing an interview with you on Friday when this happened, and your heart just dropped, you know, when we didn't know the condition or how the deputy was doing. Well, anytime you hear someone's been shot at 16 times with an AR-15 at a close range, you're going to think the worst. And we just had a clearly an act of God here in a miracle to keep that deputy from being seriously injured. He did a great job. He got a serious, serious felon off the streets. Deputy Fontenot has an amazing survival story to tell. You can hear him tell it right here exclusively on Fox 26 News Friday at 5 p.m. In Northwest Harris County, I'm Domalee Keith, Fox 26 News. And that's a good way to end the bad apple report. You know what? With a good apple, I'm glad that young man survived that. And uh, I'm glad that criminal was behind bars. Okay, so... Again, we started out the show thinking about that father, that grandfather, that public servant that I think is also was a good apple. And so we're going to end our Saturday thinking about him, thinking about this young man and the good apples out there. We spent enough time thinking about the bad apples. There's some good apples out there. All right, folks, I want you to have a great day. I really do. You've made my day, and I'm going to go get out in the field, do some stuff, and I'll see you right back here at 7.30 a.m. tomorrow morning, bright and early. Have a great day.